We're getting ready for the deciding game of Cloud9 versus Gambit Esports. And as we go up for match point, make sure to tweet at LOL Esports with the hashtag HowIWorlds. Whether you're a Cloud9 fan in Cleveland or a Gambit supporter in St. Pete, show us how you're turning into the deciding fight. Thankfully for us, Spawn, we get a front row seat here for a very spicy series, as it turned out. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think anyone really tipped this one to go towards Game 5. I think a lot of people had said that Cloud9 were starting to come together, that this was the second best team in North America at this stage, that they had run through the gauntlet so cleanly versus Team Solo Mid that this wasn't really going to be an issue. But, I mean... Things under pressure start to rear their head, and unfortunately, they are making uncharacteristic mistakes. Jensen staying for the mid lane creep wave, you know. Little bit of wonky drafts coming out of Reaper, arguably, and now Gambit find themselves in the situation where they can play the ultimate upset on the biggest stage. Certainly can, and again, something this team has been working towards for years, like not even just yep. one year. It's like the last world, and then this MSI, and now this world. Every single time, they've got further than they thought they would. So now they have the opportunity to not only upset, but to do what this team has been demanding of themselves all year long. And I think it's super impressive the way that they've done it because they have been able to build, they have been able to grow, not just over the course of the last year and a half, but even in this series, you know, game one, they arguably gave back to Cloud9. They would be kicking themselves for that now. You know, they dove a turret and a half deep and ended up just getting destroyed, honestly, at the 22 minute mark. This time around, however, they were able to play the game much more on their terms. They were able to control the Cloud9 lineup, which, to be fair, gave away a lot of early game power in favor of some late game picks. But you still have to applaud people like Diamond, like Kira, for taking advantage of that and, you know, being able to drive that advantage towards a victory. And again, mentality is such a big deal in these high pressure situations. Any last game of a best of five is going to be exactly that. You have to think, are the minds of the rookies starting to bend a little? Or even Sven Skarin, who's kind of the insurance policy that Cloud9 have brought in time and time again all year. How's he feeling? Because he was supposed to be the guy that came in and just shut the door in this series, and that has not been the case. And polarizing play coming out of Sven. So game number one has a fantastic performance, able to impact the lanes just as Diamond did in that last game. Game number two, however, you know, Jensen overstays, gets picked up for first blood. Okay, that's okay. Bottom lane, all of a sudden, you know, there's some issues happening down there. All the summoner spells are burnt. All of a sudden, you can't bully out the Nautilus. You maybe would be able to in other lanes. And Sven, honestly, was just trying to play counter gank for majority of that game. Could never go in first because the Talia would blow him up. And I think that, you know, they need to get some more priority back into his hands so that they have a more potent early game on the side of Cloud9. And I feel like, if nothing else, when we... Think about the draft upcoming in this game. We know Gambit are going to stick to you know the things they're comfortable with. Nautilus support, not, not something we were confident in, and I think rightly so, but at least a pick that Gambit made work. And in, this, in the sense of the game that they were playing against something like the Draven, that did make sense. For Cloud9, the time to innovate is over. I think you have done too many things that have been cute, that haven't worked out just yet. So just play something a bit more stable. That, that's all you can really ask for a lot of teams in a game five is to just put your best game forward. And for that, you want to go for comfort. You want to go for stuff that you know through and through. But I think that they were trying to change up the way they approached the top side of the map, given how much attention is coming out of it from Gambit. So they tried the response bands, you know, take away the likes of the Scion. Then they did try the Singe pick. That one worked out. Jarvan pick this time around due to the poppy flexibility wasn't really the answer they were looking for, but I don't think you can discredit how much work they have put into the depth of the top side of the map. Did the last one look a little bit clown? Like, absolutely, that's not the situation you want to be in if you're licorice, but he has been able to build himself advantages in other games. I think it really is the mid lane and the bottom lane where the pressure lies. Jensen having a pretty shocking performance in that game. Sneaky not able to get it rolling a couple of times against Varus. I think they would want to take the Varus off the board, and, you know, where does Sneaky go after that? I guess we'll have to find out. I mean, Kaiser has been notably absent yep. from his last few games, so obviously something that Sneaky has shown a lot of pressure. In fact, he's only played two champions all playing long, Kaiser and Draven. So we'll see if that trend does change in this final game, but we're going to move ourselves into champ select very quickly as Cloud9, again, back on the blue side. Maybe that's what they need, because their red side games have... Looked a little funky. Well, to be fair, Gambit's red side games will look pretty shocking as well. It's 100% blue side victory so far. I think it's a 61% blue side victory overall for Worlds 2018 play-ins before we had gotten into today's game. So pretty favored side of the matchup. With the potency of the first picks of Urgot, you would have to think that that lends a lot of weight towards the discrepancy as far as that goes. Well, no Urgot this time around. Gambit again, Aatrox plus Urgot banned away. Tom Kench and Nivea for Cloud9. 
And do they respect Diamond's pick? Do they take something like the Tali here as a man? Or do they even take it first pick themselves? I think you have to be thinking about Diamond, who has been kind of the person getting Gambit over the line when they need it. So I'm very curious to see what Cloud9 are thinking in this draft with this final ban. He's going to be the Varus. They take it away from Lodic. Yeah, and I think they have to. I mean, when you have a look at how well Lodic has played the laning phases when Ooh. he was able to pick up the Varus, that makes a lot of sense. And Tali getting taken off the board shakes up the path that Svenskeren's going to have to take if they are planning once again to camp top side of the map. Red side should technically suit Gambit. I think that they just have to prioritize PvP. Stay horses counter pick, however, Pastry. I've been saying it for like a lot of this series. Kira does have some control mages that you can play blind. Stahos, however, when he's been put in the counter picks, has struggled. I think the expected pick here, though, for Cloud9. I think he will go back to Kaiser. The game five here. I do wonder if Gambit have uh, something prepared here, or maybe just go back to kind of the Lucian Braun that we've seen for them already. Alstar also left up. As a result, we know that's a very good pick for Edward and something he's comfortable with, which I think in this kind of game, giving Edward something he feels stable on is yeah. pretty important because his good games and bad games have looked very different. Ease of execution becomes the key term that we will probably use throughout a lot of these mid to late game fights if we get to that point because under high pressure situations, things go all awry, especially when we're talking about rookies. Edward, obviously not a rookie, has been around for a very long time, but has had some up and down performances. Not expecting Ooh. to see things like the Thresh more along the wheelhouse of the Alistar or the Braum. And you said, ooh, that's an Olaf lock -in. Yeah, there's been Olaf bans in this series. Certainly a champion that uh, we've seen a little coming into the tournament and that was picking up a bit of steam. But Diamond's just going to take it here. Once an early tempo jungler for himself. Yeah, I'd love to see something like the Zac and the Rise picked up. Get yourself some backline access if you're able to. And I think that, you know, even though that's not the case, that is exactly what Cloud9 are going to look for in their own right. Jensen's rise has looked very good this world. However, I think that if it gets dropped into the second priority, you do run the risk of, you know, either counter picks or something like the Galio once again coming across and being able to shut down some of the early game aggression. Is Alstar as well, so Cloud9 giving comfort to their bot lane here, and Kaiser Alstar has been a mainstay of the tournament so far. Looks like Jensen is also going to be gifted an early pick here in this draft and will get that rise again. And now you get the best situation if you are Gambit Esports. You have the potential to take support here, which potentially they have done because Gragas is that flex, can yep. also go top lane. And now you can double counter pick, you know? They might take away some of Ryze's better matchups, you know, maybe expect a Galio, Cassiopeia ban coming across in case that is what wants to happen. But at the same time, you get to target another couple of picks towards Licorice. You can maybe take away the Singed. And you have flexibility to be able to play around this draft now if you Gambit. There is a Singe band away. Very curious to see what Gambit want to do with this Gragas. Because I think Cloud9 are likely thinking of something like Orn for Licorice. We've seen it time and time again. I don't think Kaiser you give Alistar. them Orn in this composition. I think this is, next band goes towards Orn. That's what we've seen from Gambit for the majority of this series. I agree with you that Orn would fit this composition very nicely, especially given the fact that, you know, Sven still does have damaged jungles available. Something like a Kindred, something like a Graves could become up and available to try and match tempo with Diamond Prox as Olaf. But if Gambit let it through now, I expect it to be picked right after this ban. And that's part of it, right? Is because if Gragas is going top, do Cloud9 think we like we can get away with not banning it? I don't think so. I think that they would have the read that potentially Edward would be playing that one. We've already seen support Gragas once at the world's playing stage. I think they know that that is a possibility. Do they run the risk of you know, potentially trying to counter pick an Orn in the top lane without Urgot, without Darius available, that becomes more difficult, and that's what they're doing. Hobby banned. So we'll see what Gambit do take here for themselves. Very tense first pick out of this phase. And you can see a little bit of confusion potentially as they're looking at what the pick could be. I still expect this to be the Orn pickup. Yep. And there it is for Gambit. So we'll be support Gragas most likely, unless Kira has gone uh, really fancy extreme, himself. <laughs> extremely far off the deep end. And now what do they have? Do they go back towards something like Lissandra top lane that we've seen out of Licorice, which would suit kind of the team fight flavor of this, would create some big spaces, short range AD carry. That makes a lot of sense to me. So that would potentially be my pickup. And that's what I was going to say. I think the big thing here is get a jungler that farms at a high rate. Because Olaf's weakness is that he falls off a cliff towards the latter stages of the game. Kaiser will shred Olaf as this game progresses. 
So if you're able to have another threat, you know, something that can split up from the Kai'Sa and kind of increase the difficulty of this composition from the side of Gambit, it will certainly go a long way to winning Cloud9 the game. And it looks like Licorice will be just taking a sturdy tank into the top side of the map here. They can still play one through one with the Shannon split, push things out. Decent matchup into the tanks in general. And with Singe Band away, Licorice will just take something nice and stable. I think Cloud9 have kind of done what we expected here in this game and Ooh. just drafted very solid for themselves. Melzaha would be interesting. Doesn't have the best lane matchup. Lissandra, we've already seen fail once in the mid lane. It was triple that picked it up for the Direwolves. And there is Melzaha. And this is what Raz said. He said, how far down the team fight rabbit hole do we go for Kira? We already saw the Anivia. Now all of a sudden that's getting respect fans. Melzaha sacrifices a lot of lane pressure to be a good team fighter. One of the best. AoE silence. Very annoying to deal with in a late game team fight. Lockdown means that they're all going to have to pay the QSX tax. And if you were going to say which comp is easier to fight with, you would probably have to go with Gambit. But in saying that, 1-3-1 one, one pressure, the ability to withhold that mid lane 3 unit has been there at time for Cloud9. Raz didn't like the communication between Sven Skurin and the two, thought that when he left, they stepped up too far. I agree. But I mean, once again, these are quick adaptations that you're expecting the most veteran members of Sven, of Sneaky, to be able to make between games. Let's talk about the jungles again, because it's been four years since he's got... Three, three or four years since they faced the last time Sven and Diamond faced off. So as a reminder, Sven Skerin's all-time record versus Diamond is not good. If there is ever a time to put a win in the column, it's this game. Yeah, absolutely it is. But you're doing it with so much pressure on your shoulders. You haven't been the primary jungle. For Cloud9, you've been splitting time with Blabber, now at the world playing stage at knockout point. Cloud9, turn to the veteran. It's currently 1-1 one, one pastry. Can he get the next W? Well, we'll see. You can see the foreground of the shot there. That's Gambit sub. Looking understandably nervous. We've got all of the players from both these teams watching on. And for Reaper, he'll sit back in his chair. His work is done for this series. Win or lose. Incredible that this stage of the play has already delivered a five game banger of a series spawn. Six teleports, Pastry. Everyone picks up the globals. They know this game is going to be map pressure versus the ability to kick off team fights. And neither team wants to be in a numbers mismatch when that happens. Oh. Quickly checking for spell books as well, just to make sure I'm not missing a TP. This is so cute. He's going to walk right behind the Alistair as he shows. Edward wrapping around. Gambit had something special prepared. They can still get in here. Basil sees no one just yet. This is a great read from Zazel. We'll now just spot out Edward. Maybe going to have to flash as Pulverize going to walk out of there. How much do they commit? Sneaky over the wall, getting damage down onto Edward, and that is enough to actually cart Zazel out safely without using a cooldown. As you mentioned, no cooldown users. Aftershock comes in massive for the lineup. However, still potentially going to burn a potion before he gets the lane, as it is ticking right now. And they know where Sven Skurin is starting. So that is a great start of Summoner's Rift if you are a Gambit fan. See Diamond on the other side of the map. Also, it is red, but pathing down perhaps towards his bot lane. Since Karen does pick up red pretty swiftly, now going to move on to that Raptor camp. Edward again and just I hanging agree out. As well. So, experience advantage going to be there for the Gambit lineup. As soon as he gets the E in this matchup, Lodic will go incredibly aggressive. I think he actually has W level one. Yeah, it has W level one. Ooh, double belly bot. Edward is getting some harass down. Level two is coming up soon, Spawn. I see Ignites in his support. Edward taking some damage, but again, stepping forward, they know it's a few creeps away. Yeah, it's going to be at least two more in that matchup. You can see Kira right now doing a good job of just sustaining in this lane, and really, that's going to be the name of the game. Do not lose as hard as you did in game number one, game number two against Jensen. Jensen's performances has slowly, honestly, degraded as this best of five has gone on. Needs to look to retain the form from earlier in the series. 
the Cassidy matchup just didn't seem to suit him. With the way he's been playing today, with how well he has kind of been able to win out the laning phase, putting him on something that was always going to have to go late was a risk, and it didn't work out. Diamond straight under the Infernal, though, at level three. Ultra aggressive jungle pathing here. It certainly is. He's going to go very low, but that only speeds up the take of what will be the early Infernal Dragon. Interested to see if he has to call someone over here because he doesn't have all that much mana pastry and he also doesn't have a smite charge. Uh, it's going, coming up back available, so he will have it there. Should be fine. Kind of worked it all out. Diamond with a very sneaky path, and there is the Infernal. Cloud9 get the bad news. And I mean, that's really well played because you can see they've already cheated Kira into Fog of War. Done a fantastic job of being able to pick up the first objective of this game number five. And as this is going to be a game that comes all down to the fight, there probably is no better dragon to start stacking up at this point of the game. I think especially when you expect it to go somewhat late, given that teams will be playing pretty carefully. Diamond, very creative pathing. The four camp I didn't expect. The Sven's looking here in me. Chance of flash Kira, such respect instantly flashes away. Yeah, because if he doesn't do that, as soon as the shield falls off, he is rooted, he probably gets chunked out. And even though he might not have fallen down, Pastry, he would not have the HP to be able to continue this laning phase. You can see then he floats bottom side of the river, make sure that the repeat gank, even if Svenskeren did stick around, isn't going to be available. While she can critique Jensen's performance in the last few games, I think you do have to give praise to the CIS mid laner who has really picked it up. Yep, his TP in, well, back into lane as well, so Kira needing to be extra careful in that situation. I do like that bit of pressure from Sven Skerin. Zazel, angry fist ground. <laughs> Just testing. You're not going to make sure the button's calibrated properly. Is Jensen going to take down these Voidlings? Running low on mana, though, probably going to have to burn his TP himself pretty quickly, and stay off onto Licorice. Nice trade. Yeah, has burned through all of his mana. Obviously, didn't build the Sapphire Crystal first, which is what you normally see out of the Ornn in the top lane. Probably building one now, to be fair. Oh, the red one in... Oh, he's got two. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> and uh, he's going to be absolutely fine. This is a lane that Chen after first back, whether he goes Tiamat or Sunfire, should be able to push up in. Uh, Brittle really does hurt. Uh, but as soon as you know you got Spirit Refuge on a little bit more of a shorter cooldown, you can start navigating some of these trades. Jensen does TP back also. There is Boots plus Tier now finished, so will feel a bit more comfortable in the matchup. And Diamond. Oh, he might face check Sven here. Who's going to blink first? Oh, Sven's Garen sees him. Good bit of reconnaissance. Very nicely done from both of these junglers. We said that game two was kind of going to be who counter gank who. Who was first to the play with the globals of it? We're probably going to take Ooh! Ignite down. This might be a kill. Lodic, I think, is just clear of it. But that was close. Certainly was. And it's only Ignite. They get the... Flash out, going to probably have to teleport back for this wave as well. So C9 pick up a big objective in that bottom lane, being able to first out, uh, force out that summoner spell. I have to walk so far back as well. Edward's like, just don't W my carry. He does make sure he walks around and blocks it, but as you said, it's going to force that quick TP. Bit of extra damage here for Sneaky and Zazel on the turret. They'll clean up some creeps. And Lodic even going to eat some harass on the TP down. Didn't even get his health bar fully replenished. That's how fast that TP was. And this is a combat ultimate. Realm Warp in there. Sven Skerin going to bounce it off the wall. The ult from Kira is nice, but Jensen's still fighting oh. it out. And I think it's not quite enough. The Aerie, though, does get the trade. What a play out of Kira to turn that around. Sure, you got to say that that was a nicely timed gank coming out of Sven Skerin, But I do not think that Jensen thought he was going to be returned on. Kira will lose a creep wave, but this is perfect. Yeah, and it is our Acer Predator replay as Jensen runs in there with the wrong weapon. Kira just says, okay, let's stop that. And the ability to just break up the combo to get fresh Voidlins out meant that there was a little bit of space gain. And the kill return going over to the mid lane means that arguably Kira comes out ahead in that situation. Sven does push the lane in, but Jensen. Forced to walk back, doesn't have too much more, just the non-magic mantle, whereas Kyrus finished that, lo finish that lost chapter. Thanks, Garen, eating bad end of a trade there from Lodic. Not quite able to proc the plasma. Does have an early BF though, so again, that all-in that almost killed Lodic does bear fruit for C9's bot lane. And it's just giving them the push priority. That is such a big deal for a Kaiser to be able to shove in on what looks to be the counter pick for the Gambit lineup in the form of this. Lucian hasn't really done well the few times it has been picked up for them and 
have to start questioning whether this is the lane that they want or whether it does better towards the late game. Because right now, it just seems that Kaiser is winning out in both regards. Tart at 50% health, but Cloud9 gonna back away and maybe clear some vision here. Says will get some down of his own, so we'll spot Edward almost around the side. Blast plant shot by Sneaky as Sven continuing to check out the area as well, making sure he can cover for the pushed up bot lane. And I think Diamond has to get a little bit more busy on the map pastry. There are points where Kiros is going to be able to shove out, look for a window, potentially look for a gank, but really without Diamond. Oh, Edward goes in, that's in big trouble. Yeah, it does have his spot, but didn't quite connect it. That's going to be a stun. Sneaky wants to finish it off, but he can't quite get it. The Killer Instinct, though, he's going to get it, and Cloud9 starting to win this bot lane a little harder than Gambit would like. And the Dosi do again, Sneaky just bypasses the two carries, takes out the support. And we already mentioned, we think this is going towards team fights. Well, Sneaky has been the king of them so far at play-ins. And Jensen also exerting will here, but there's the Voidling. Jensen with a quick QSS. Able to continue the all-in, but the Voidling block means his Qs won't quite connect. Now a TB committed as we're back down to the bot side. And Sazel finds the dive. Here's the Shen riding in as well. Cloud9 looking to take it all, but Stay off with the knockup. Does find Licorice. Sneaky, he's trying to finish off the turret in the meantime. And Licorice will dash over the wall to safety. And whilst they save the turret, it is on no HP, and they also expend the teleport. Stehos without ultimate cannot continue this fight. And Cloud9 just picking up victories everywhere. Yep, maybe an Ocean Drake as well. Off the back of this play, they are going to start it. They'll force Gambit to fight them if they dare. I don't know if they want this, but it looks like they're trying. I mean, they have to go for it. They cannot allow this gold lead to continue. This is the best opportunity they're going to have. Stayos again finds the knockup, but he's sneaky. Then he gets it. Zazel goes back in on Akira, who explodes to the Kaiser. It's continuing to chain together kills. Sven, he smites the Drake and takes it down. They're trying to chase. Licorice gets damage boosted to safety by the ult of Edward. And Jensen with no mana just walks out scot-free. And one more time, it is just Gambit not on the same page. Second Gragas game, not able to use the cast to guarantee kills. And this is Edward just shorting the body slam, not close enough, gets red like a book, gets stunned up. But really, you got to applaud Sneaky. Sees the only way to survive is probably to go back to the target, grabs himself the kill at the same time. And in response to that, Gambit just burns so much because they know that this game right now hanging by a thread. Jensen low on mana, but Spell fluxes through most of those minions. We'll be able to take them down. Does that TP up soon if he wants to come back? And we talk about the Kaiser. When she's even or slightly behind, she feels pretty good. This is the Kaiser that is ahead on CS and has already finished a Storm Razor. And Sneaky before this series had not died. Pre-15 minutes. Terra on the other hand. Zazel forcing a flash. Ulti though. Maybe gonna force some breakable wall. It's back up soon. I think it's Got gonna it. be out of time for Zazel. Goodbye! Diamond with the final axe. Really nicely done from Kira there. Able to once again flash the headbutt pole combo. We saw it in game number two. This game, no difference. Turns the game by some respite. Tower goes down in bot side. Held my breath there because I thought Lodic was about to get all in. But Sneaky does take the tower, continuing to mount a massive individual gold lead in this game. Mr. Reliable for Cloud9 for so long. They have 18 CS in the top lane, and then the rest of the gold lead belongs to Sneaky right now. Really has done a great job on this late game carry during the earlier phases. You know, it's got to take your hats off to Zazel as well, who's always been there on the LSR, but Sneaky now in a position where wherever he rotates around the map is going to be very difficult to match. Riptail here over to Cloud9 as well, but I think you're right, Zazel does deserve some credit. For a rookie, he has not shied away from making plays on the stage. Has he made some mistakes? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> but pretty unafraid to try things when he knows they'll work, and learning at a pretty rapid pace on a big, massive stage this early on in his career is promising for a team that is just trying to push themselves to another main event group stage. And one more time, it looks like they want the play. Oh, Patriot. what a taunt! There's Edward gonna get KI'd on and Sneaky able to get the kill. Diamond here, but Jensen already roaming up as Sven's made his way here as well. And you can see the Gambit are very concerned. They know that they have the team fighting comp that they have to be able to get to the mid stage of the game, but they just cannot match waves right now. They're only tools in a fight. 
and every single time they go for it, C9 beat them to the punch. And that's Sneaky collecting kill after kill. 75% of the total kills that C9 have belong to Sneaky. As Jensen gonna try and force Kira away. Hoidling's up. Moves forward into the silence, just barely clips him. Jensen QSS, he's gonna all in here on Takira. Still moving the minions through. Damage is good, Jensen, he's going all the way under. He doesn't have a stopwatch, he really wanted the all in. He is forced to flush away, however. In the end, he has to burn the summoner spells, maybe a little bit too aggressive. Kira didn't have mana, would have been some pressure on the mid lane turret. Jensen, still making some questionable decisions. However, this one doesn't cost him his life, and as this game progresses, Gambit have just forced maybe a little bit too much. They haven't had information when they make the play. Look at how dark the map is. Top side as Edward just walked through without anyone on his team. You understand what the thought process is. You know, we need to get into team fight situations, but the first step is always obtain vision and not to force that hard. And again, have to keep pointing to the night and day performances of Edward here. When he's looked good, he's looked great. When he's looked bad, that's unfortunately the kind of replays we've been looking at. Cloud9 continue to apply pressure. 3,000 gold ahead, forcing the TP from Lodic. Sneaky is rapidly approaching a sub-20 minute Ginsu's Rage Blade, which is terrifying on the Gambit side. We'll eventually have to stop for a QSS, which will give some respite. But still, obviously, a very nice item to have against the Malzahar. But the big thing here for Sneaky is just that how well he has demonstrated he can perform when he gets the items behind him. When he has been challenged in the laning phase by Lodic, Lodic has looked very good, but that was primarily on the Varus pastry. This time around on the Lucian again, Sneaky does not seem bothered by this pick at all. See Gambit grouping three up the top here, but Sven already behind, covering for his laners once again. He's done a really good job of being in the right place at the right time this go round. Just Diamond, who has unfortunately been unable to do too much in this early game. C9 are all over Gambit's place here, and every time they walk in, without that vision, they are getting punished, and Cloud9 are rapidly looking to take down yet another turret here. And look at how worried they are, because now Kira cannot fight for mid lane. We already saw how heavily Jensen wins that skirmish, even if he did have to burn flash from turret diving. And you can see that every single time he's pushed in, he just walks into Hog of War, top side of mid lane, and everyone has to leave. So Sneaky takes his second solo turret of the game with three kills with a CS advantage. Oh, Edward. He does cancel Svenskeren's Rift Tower. Jensen's still getting jumped on. The Realm Warp is there. He's not going to make it out, though. And the fuel's still coming. Diamond Flash Order gets the kill, but C9 still collapsing. Sneaky's in. Here's the off from Stehas. But Liquid with a wonderful taunt. Actually, not quite soon enough. As Kira getting low. But Liquid has now overstepped his bounds. And Kira actually comes up with a kill. Sneaky is going to try and turn back around as Zazel exits the fight. And this is what we said they needed. Get the team fight scan, but they're able to grab that one. Two kills might turn it into the Infernal Dragon as well. Hesitation one more time, however, Pastry. Just jockeying between the two objectives. Unfortunate timing there for Gambit, but as you mentioned, maybe a little slow to uh, Infernal. They're still there as Jensen, with the TP almost back and ready to go, could make something happen, but Gambit do secure that second Infernal for themselves. And still a 3,000 gold lead, still Cloud9 in firm control, but these Infernals will start to matter. Oh, you hate to see it. However, he does get the stop. They do ultimately pick up the kill here off the back end of some very nice axes from Diamond Proc. And when the teleports were completed, you thought maybe C9 could turn it. But as you mentioned, this taunt right here misses. Stahos got the knock up on the back end. That meant that Licorice fell down. And without their top laner, without their mid laner, there is no way for C9 to fight. And Jensen, someone that has been the victim of many a heartbreaking Game 5 scenario. Starting to show some signs of mental instability, let's call it. But never at this stage of a tournament. Coming into Worlds, Cloud9 were a shoe in to get out of play in stage. Gambit looked shocking against Flash Wolves when they were playing at the MSI Best of Five. This time, however, Team members are stepping up when it counts. And that redemption still on the table here for Gambit. If they can hold on, two Infernals will help as the game gets later, but Cloud9 continuing to get aggressive. 
and that's, leverage that gold lead. That's a big thing. They still have the ability to push up their side lane. They still have, if they want, the ability to put Sneaky into the mid lane and start absorbing farm for themselves. They still have outer turrets up and available, whereas Gambit do not have those options. So their jungle is still being encroached on, it's still being taken away. The problem is, is that if you continue to funnel over gold, if you allow them to get to this mid-game portion when the infernal drakes will start to matter, they have such an explosive team fight. Like Chris dancing around, good taunt. Still getting chased down though by the Ragnarok Dolaf, but Diamond can't really chase too much more. Jensen continuing to apply that pressure to Kira as well. You can see Diamond didn't want to throw the first axe because of exactly that. As soon as he threw it, it was over. But uh, very nicely played by Licorice. He's just a patient player. Under the pressure, he looks to be standing pretty firm at the moment. Reminder, still a rookie. Not as fresh, perhaps, as both Flava and Zazel, but this is his first year as a professional player, continuing to go from strength to strength as the year rides on. And for Cloud9, it has been an extremely turbulent year. They were pretty happy to make it this far, given all that transpired in these last 12 months. But like any team, they will be incredibly unhappy to take a loss here. And Riot Freak did remind me, NA's record in tiebreakers and game fives in best of fives at Worlds and MSI is abysmal. Big bagel in the wing column, abysmal. Is it really? That is not what you want to hear if you're a North American fan right now, remember. Gambit have never lost to them either. Lodic going forward, Pastry. Looking for it here, but Lodic maybe a bit too aggressive. Ult from Sven. Zayz will stop by Edward. Sneaky again with two items done, but here's the Sentry Knight and onto the Alistar. He's already popped Unbreakable Wheel, but Licorice will make sure the support gets out safely. RC9 too far forward for this turret. Looks like they are going very far up the lane for it. You can see already the rotation coming out of Stehos. Did not have the teleport to join. Licorice is about to become available off cooldown. But they get out, no harm, no foul. And still, C9 pushing up in the lanes, have the advantage gold-wise. But Gambit just looking to turn some of these aggressive plays. Won't take much to make this game feel a lot more even. In fact, Gambit even with some initiative here in mid lane, and be able to take the outer turret. Oh, actually, that's going to be a Ryze ulti coming in just to try and dissuade them. It's just a prank. But I was going to say, this is the ultimate for the Gambit lineup. If they can open up the map, if they even trade turrets from this point and just make Summoner's Rift as big as possible and start being able to force around objectives, that is the key. You don't want to give Cloud9 the ability to retreat to a tier one turret. They will still be meaningful at this stage, you know? Once Dayhoss gets his third item, maybe not so much. Horn will just take it forever. Come on, from Gambit. They found one. They're going to get the chain CC and they take down Zazel with no ulti. Sneaky, though, still staying alive. Needs to keep cutting around as the Jensen. tank are trying to chase him. Diamond a little too far forward, but Jensen almost dead as a result. Spam with the ulti. Does get it, but Stayhoss there with a solo Sneaky on the right hand side of the fight. That's what Gambit need. Certainly is, and can they go towards Baron? Svenskeren is still available, but the bottom lane is dead. Does not look to be the case. When you have things like Malzahar up and available, you can always force early on it in the game. But Jensen on the back end of that team fight, just hiding out, pumping out so much damage. <laughs> Since Garen shoots that crap, just barely flash torn from Licorice. In onto Edward, he's got the Titanic going. Needs a few more autos. Sword pull, not there. Flash forward from Sven, he wants it. Smoke oh. screen is enough. Red Smite OP, able to pick it up on the back end of that. Looked like Edward was going to be able to survive. One more passive proc would have done it. The Cloud9 turned the fight back in their favor. Now look to pressure mid lane turret. This game has been an absolute seesaw of emotion. It's starting to descend into madness, Spawn. As Cloud9, they want the outer turret here in mid, but two items on the Malzahar will shut that down in an instant. And now another Drake coming back up in 25 seconds. Baron very much at the forefront of both these teams. This is just an aggressive start to the play. A flash forward into the ultimate onto the support. You can see Sneaky took so much damage on the back end of it. And Jensen is able to turn around. That damage there was crucial onto Diamond. It turned the team fight back in their favor. Big shutdown coming across as well for Sven. And they start up Baron off the back end of the fight. Gambit know this is happening. I don't think they can stick around. Oh, nine just forcing them to the area. They get their wish. But a very aggressive so if you see nine, Do you really want to force this team comp to the area? Sure, they've just used some crucial flashes, but 
You're still going up against the team fight presence of a Melzaha, of an Orn. At this stage of the game, you know, Olaf as well as Lucian, they're completely fine. And if they are able to isolate Sneaky again, who is so much of this gold lead, Gambit looks fine. Gambit calmly walk to Baron. Bop over to the right hand side, take the Ocean Drake for themselves. That's now three Drakes to one. And two of those for Gambit are Infernals. And I'm very surprised that Cloud9 hasn't stuck in this setup of the map for longer. Because they've got Shen just passively catching a wave, obviously can teleport away with the Stand United, going to end a lot of combat stats. And at this stage of the game, if you're the Yawn, the last place you want to be matched up against is a mobile mate. Because he just clears waves better than you, he's going to be able to pressure you. And I think that if Cloud9 can guarantee these lane assignments for a little bit longer, this is when they start being able to have pressure. And there's not all that much engaged with Edward's flashdown in the three. They're really relying on a rotation. You really need this turret, though, to kind of complete that picture. And Gambit are being incredibly stubborn and in protecting it, and rightly so. So for how big the map seems for Cloud9 with their two side lane threats, Gambit just protecting this potent part of the map with their lives. Flank coming in here. Stayos gonna face check, dashes out of the way. Oh, Stazel's in there, just zips right in to start the fight off. Sneaky now going in with a killer instinct, he's riding Licorice in. What a delivery from Cloud9. And you can see how the team fights are supposed to work. A big flank, a great engage, and now it's a 3v5. Around Baron as well, C9 says, stuff the mid turret. We're going back to Baron, Licorice over the top. C9 will force them into the pit. And eyes on Zazel has the splash. Hex flash, what a play, first one diamond. It's the target they want, they get him down. They'll get Kira as well. The rookie comes up massive for Cloud9. And finally they're able to get the flank set looking for Cloud9, turn the game on its head. They're gonna grab themselves the Baron and they're going to pick up a 7,000 gold lead. And NA, if any of you are awake at this ungodly hour, <laughs> reminder, it is not over yet, but this is how the wins that Cloud9 picked up have looked. Solid mid-game advantages, winning those crucial team butts, taking the Baron, and just running away with the game. And back-to-back, -back, massive plays from the rookie. He does so much of the shot calling. He says, I'm going, gets onto the two tanky members. But remember, at this stage, Sneaky is so better. The ability to deliver the Shen is even better. I mean, the first one was impressive enough, but then the ability, the heads-up play, to know you have Hex Flash available, to come over the wall and get the jungler at this stage of the game to guarantee the kill onto Kira as well. Secure your team, Baron. That is so impressive. And that play may be the one that wins Cena in the game as Jensen tries to roam up over, but Diamond does flash out to safety. Still, C9 finally kicked down the mid lane out of turret and looking to take a lot more than that with this gold lead that is rapidly approaching 10k. And now it's panic stations for Gambit. They go in. Yep, they're looking for the play. They need to get a kill. Liquor's pretty tanky, but he is getting burnt down. Needs a few more shots. The Spirit's Refuge may protect him. And now Sven Skarin snipes slotting him to Zazel. Makes yet another initiation play. He is getting low. He will fall down. And Gambit actually might be able to chase here. Don't know if they can overstay. Jensen still mid lane, knocking down turrets. Even though that looked okay for Gambit, it was a 5v4. Wonder where the missing member was. You are correct, it was Jensen. Gambit know that they just need to back off and protect these inhibitor turrets more than anything. And because they got the two kills pastry time, they feel confident they can move back up. They're looking to crack the base. And Steos is not safe versus three item Kaiser. Even though one of them is advantaged, he just has almost no stats right now. And they're just going to bust down this turret, expose the inhibitor, look for Steos and try and get even more. That should secure this in here. Lodic is back alive, but it's too late to save the base. And now it's 12,000 gold. Now if you were Gambit, you are in a do or die situation, backed against the wall. As you mentioned, this is a three item Kaiser. And this is a desperation play, it looks good. They juggle him for nearly maximum CC. And he just wanders out. Then you're allowing Sneaky to free hit. You've already used all of your CC, unfortunately. And he just tears apart the entire team. Once again, this was all with Jensen just sitting mid lane. Split pushing. No need to rotate to that play. Cloud9 now with that bottom pressure point well and truly opened up. Gonna move Jensen off to the other side lane. 
look for him to get those top minions moving. Still 40 seconds left on Baron. Good amount of time to try and break another inhibitor turret here in mid lane. And we're only 27 minutes in, and Cloud9's comp was always going to come online. They were always going to be able to team fight. But Sneaky's level 16 nearly already versus the level 13 of his opponent. He's got himself a QSS as well. He is just so safe and already so strong. I just don't know now if you're a Gambit how you navigate these team fights. Well, it's going to take a chain of miraculous CC to lock down these carries. Cloud9, they know they're just a few steps away from locking down this game. Diamond Fox is trying to find a flank, but Olaf at this point, it's, it's so tough for Olaf to do anything. He melts like butter as he charges in towards the carries. Yeah, we said that it was going to eventually get tough. Well, it got tough a little bit earlier than expected. Kiri doesn't even have a shield, and I think that if they don't go on this turret, it's going to be very difficult to come back. And no Baron, but his rock portal there from Licorice is actually applying a pretty good stream of pressure to the outer turret in mid. C9 still juggling between mid and top with the supers from bot finally hitting that Nexus turret. You can see there on the right hand side. They gotta go now. They only grab Zazel. They do get Sneaky for a bit as well. They get Snock back in. They all see that from Kira. Sneaky though holds firm, does not burn the QSS. And now he's just gonna rip through the lineup. Everyone from Gambit is going down. The Shen gets a triple and C9 ride the party portal into the base and onto the next stage of world. It has been a year of turmoil, but in the last game when it matters most, they push through. And everyone from C9 should be very happy with that final game performance. Rookie and veteran alike rising to the occasion, punching their ticket for groups, but boy, was that a best of five. Gambit did not make it easy. You can see Diamond understandably disappointed. A team that wanted to make it one step further. This game win would have been that step, but I think Gambit can still hold their heads high after the performance they've shown today. And to be fair, I think a game five is also that next step. They got destroyed by Flash Wolves, who looked in form at MSI. C9, not necessarily the same here. Did look up and down even throughout the playing stages, but people thought in a best of five with how prepared they would be by Reaper, this would be a fairly one-sided affair. It was not that, but still they pick up the win. All six members of Cloud9 will take a bow in front of the crowd. And now look onward. They're good. They can relax for a couple series <laughs> and await the group stage. A victory that did not come easy, but Cloud9 do earn their spot back into the main groups of Worlds. And they showed some cool things. They showed the diversity in Licorice's champion pool. His ability to play, you know, not only the carry versus carry matchups in the Urgot versus the Aatrox. He also had a couple of Shen game, uh, a Shen game in there. Had a Singe game as well to be able to show that variety. But I really think that you know, it was around the mid lane and the bottom lane when Jensen looked okay, when Sneaky was able to scale up and get into these team fights untouched, and in that late game, he exploded. That was when the game looked pretty smooth for the Cloud9 faithful, and I, I think that, you know, that is going to be more tough to secure as this uh, tournament progresses. I mean, you assume that as you go on, the opponents only get harder, but it is nice to see Jensen just dominating lanes a little bit more. Not in every game, yep. but showing more of his old self where he just Built up big CS leads is something nice to see, but that's all for us for now, Spawn. It's been a fun one, but we are going to throw it back to the analyst desk. Thank you very much, Pastry. C9 did it. Trial by fire for the rookies and the veterans, I should say. I don't think this is easy for anyone, but Cloud9 rises above and grabs that spot in group stage. We got to congratulate them because I think this was the most... Uh, convincing game of the whole best of five. They really all came together for this final so important victory. I mean, I think it was the best played game in the entire series for both teams. I thought yes. Gambit's draft was great. I thought C9's draft was great. And I think both of them played very well to those draft strengths and multiple people were stepping up finally after what was a slow start for people in the series. And after the congratulations, I think you can probably be like, <sighs> because it wasn't easy. And uh, I think that's all the more where we have to credit both Gambit for putting up a fight, but also C9 for, you know, making the game go their way when it was most important. That's the thing, because we often give them credit for creativity in their drafting, but this is a point where it actually just hurt them a lot. Yeah. So it got to the final game, 
Worked out very well. You got the Kaisa once again. It went towards the bottom side of the map. Sneaky had a lead as you would expect it to, be, to, and you played through it. And that's all we really wanted to see out of C9. Let's take a look at some uh, team fights that went in the favor of C9. And Mark, you were echoing this as well. In previous games, if the Kaisa is open, if the Rise is open, just pick it. And I think you see when they pick it, what they can do. Yeah, I mean, this was my win condition of not wanting to do anything fancy, not just to hide information, but because C9 clearly have a style that works best for them. And when they stray away from it, they struggle. Sneaky on the Kaisa was supposed of champions to make sure he can go and make the big plays and carry the game. But Zazel also had the best game he's had in plans, where we just wanted to see somebody on the squad out of the 10 players have a fantastic game because it's been a really down and dirty series. And I thought Zazel really stood out here as well. Yeah, I think Zazel stood out. I think Kira really stepped up and was able to find a lot of plays onto Jensen as well. And so it was kind of surprising that both teams like pillars of what should be the strongest point flipped in game five where uh, in game four to an extent where Kira started beating Jensen but Sneaky started beating Lodic. Mm -hmm. uh, things evolved as the series went on but at the end of the day the MasterCard player of the game for game five was Sneaky almost poetic he was one of the players that five years ago at IEM was also playing versus Moscow five and now Gambit and he is a guy that through all the years has stood there as a carry and I think that on its own is impressive but the fact that he is again a strong point for the team here is, well, really good for C9 in these important moments. Calm, keen eye, and this is in a game five too, where a lot of these players are starting to tell or sort of just lose focus. A good example would be Jensen as the series went on. But I thought that Sneaky really stayed firm a lot of the times. You saw in the play that just happened there. Got them an early game lead, what you didn't expect in a counter matchup. Wonderful. Uh, we didn't crown a player of the series, but I would like to know from you guys who would be eligible for that. Uh, I think it has to be Sneaky, and I don't think it's too close. You can maybe say Licorice would be the other guy. Jensen was too erratic. The jungler swapped out. Zazel was hit or miss a little bit. Uh, Sneaky did have his Draven games, which I didn't love. Mm -hmm. um, but that felt like branching out, and if people are just going to give him Kaisa, you can take Kaisa, and it feels like go 6-1-5 and five at will. Yeah. yeah. I would, I would echo the statement. Maybe give more props to Zazel, but I think it was just the bottom lane of C9 that came through. Yeah, and it, I think maybe this fact that it went all the way to five games... Um, now kind of prep them in a way for going into a group stage. Now, I'd love to talk to you guys about uh, how Cloud9 is going to look and what they need to work on and what we are expecting, but I believe the interview is ready in just a bit. So on the same vein, I'd like to say goodbye to Gambit and just say that for me, they came into today much better than I thought. Uh, and it was a bit up and down, of course, but they showed some strengths that I hadn't expected them to show. A lot of heart for yeah. the Gambit roster, a lot of heart, because a lot of the individual players were not up to par in Group D, but they really rallied behind. You see the group set up every single time before a game, they came out as a team. So a lot, uh, big props to them coming into this best of five. Yeah, I think NA fans and players came in almost arrogant and kind of looking past them, but Gambit really struck fear into everyone's heart. I mean, even in game five, when they started making those plays around mid lane, I think a lot of people really thought that they could have taken this series. It got difficult and it took five games, but Cloud9 did qualify for groups. And to hear from one of the players crucial in doing so, let's send it over to Avli for an interview. Thanks, guys. I am here with Cloud9's jungler, Sven Skarin. Congratulations on the match and moving on to the next stage. But I got to say, full five-game series versus Gambit, no one really expected that. Why was the series so close? Uh, I think Gambit performed pretty well in this series. And I think they had a lot of picks we weren't really prepared to play against. Like, I think the bottling picks were really caught us off guard. And just the bottling, when they had priority, they were able to, like, really take over the game. And I think Diamond Prox also Played super well when he was on the Talia. So I think overall they're just do, they're a pretty solid team. And I think we didn't really underestimate them. But yeah, it just took us long to like grind out the series. And what do you think needs to be cleaned up moving on to the next stage? Uh, I mean, obviously, depending on what group we get, we probably get group B. It's going to be super hard for us. And I think we're just going to just obviously try our best. And if we get smashed and whatever like if we are able to upset in the group then it's just a bonus so I think just going in with like not really any expectations and just try our best is going to be the best for us. So I think uh, coming into this game both NA fans and the desk were a little worried that in an interview Reaper basically announced that you'd be playing at least one game today so how confident were you guys coming into the matchup that you were comfortable with sharing that information? Uh, I mean me and Blava has been splitting scrims the whole boot camp, and he got the, to play the play-in games, which I think was pretty good for him to get some more experience. And starting in the series was also good for him just to get more experience. And I think 
I was comfortable going on stage as long as, uh, like, whatever my team needed me. So as long as my team needs me to step up, then I'll just be playing uh, as solid as I can and not really like let the team down. So I don't, I don't think there's really an advantage in them knowing I'll be playing. So I don't think it was weird of him to state that. So then, has there been any discussion on splitting more series in the future? Uh, I mean, obviously, we'd, we we're just going to decide who plays. Depends on our play style and the enemy's team play style. Whatever is going to be better for the series. So I don't think we can say now whoever's going to start. Well, fingers crossed for that Group A or Group B. Since scaring, congratulations again on the win. And that's it from us here. But stick around because after the break, we're going to see DFM take on EDG. Realmwarp in there, Sven Skerin gonna bounce it off the wall. The ult from Kyrie is nice, but Jensen's still playing oh. it out, and I think it's not quite enough. Sneaky wants to finish it off, but he can't quite get it. The killer instinct, though, he's gonna get it. Sneaky's in, here's the ult from Stehas, but Liquid with a wonderful taunt, actually not quite soon enough. As Kira getting low, but Liquid just now overstepped his bounds, and Kira actually comes up with a kill. Yeah, 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 I'm looking, I'm turning, I'm turning, turning here. Yeah, I got it, I got it. Finish him, finish him. Oh, there, 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 they do get Sneaky for a bit as well, he gets knocked back in. They ulti there from Kira, Sneaky though, holds firm, does not burn the QSS, and now he's just gonna rip through the lineup. Everyone from Gambit is going down. The Shen gets a triple, and C9 ride the party bottle into the base, 